Welcome, everybody, to the Weekly Grind Podcast, episode number 86. I'm your host, Keith Fabry, with my co-host, IFBB Pro, Dr. Todd Lee. Todd, welcome back. Hello. All right, Todd, tonight we have with us IFBB Pro bikini competitor, Katie Koffel. Katie, welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. Hello. All right, we got uh, wanted to branch out here the last couple weeks. We've done uh, some female competitors. We had Wendy Fortino on the last show. Uh, we want to get a few more female competitors in here to kind of um, give a little bit more insight to some of our female listeners and maybe get some more female listeners. Who knows? Uh, but so we had a figure competitor on. I figured we get a, a pro bikini competitor on and especially one that and the one that's interesting to me is and I've seen because I've been following you for quite a while is that your attitude about just competing in general and, and working hard and being OK with the process of moving up the ranks and stuff, you know, cause I, one of your posts that you had on your story here, I, I was, I would look at it and I went about somebody who is, you know, they're complaining about, you know, not competing and, and not getting, not getting, you know, the instant gratification or talking about, you know, genetics being everything. And you're like, no, <laughs> it's not, it's not genetics. Trust me. It's hard work. There's some genetic component, but you still have to put forth the effort. So that's why I wanted to get you on to talk about some of that, because that's kind of like the attitude that Todd and I share with everything. And it's best, you know, hard work, the harder the way you train, the harder you diet is, is going to make the biggest difference in anything above genetics. So with that, if people don't know who you are, I'm going to let you tell us some of your contest history, how you got started and go ahead. Okay. Awesome. So yeah, um, my first show was 2016. And I don't really remember, you know, how I got started. I, I worked out. I was in the gym a lot. Um, a lot of people would tell me you should compete. Um, you look like you should. And it's not really me. I was like, no, no, no. I always said no. I always said I'll never do that. It's not really me. And then I don't really know, like, what made me decide to do it. I guess just, like, a goal to work towards. So um, there was a bodybuilder at my gym. I got with him. I was like, do this. I'm in it to win it. I want to win. So won my first show, 2016. Um, I did nationals that year. Got third call outs at nationals. Um, didn't know what I was doing. I didn't belong there, really. Next year, I did nationals again. I turned pro, 2017. Um, and I've done, let's see. 12 shows total, probably. Um, I still feel like I'm fairly new to the pro, you know, just the pro circuit and pro shows and everything. Mm -hmm. So learning a lot. And yeah, just enjoying the whole, the whole thing. Oh, what I've noticed is that since you've turned a pro, a pro, you were, what, like 18th, 16th, 14th the first year. And then all of a sudden it's like 10th ninth and it's like you're just moving up the ranks as you go you know and that's just you know and still going I, a lot of i would say that a lot of girls would have already quit yep you know yeah. and that's that's the one thing i think that i see the most is and that's even and that's not just the pro level that's at the npc level they they yeah. go in they don't get the instant gratification of placing first and getting you know or second in their first two shows and they're like this isn't for me it's like put some effort into it I like people are People don't realize is that I don't know Todd what you did, but my first show ever, I was seventh as a middleweight. <laughs> I was a middleweight at seventh out of fifteen, and I could have hung it up, but I just slowly but surely over the years kind of moved up until I started winning shows and getting overalls and stuff, you know. And it's like it takes time, and you know, and and the higher up the ranks you go, the more time you're going to end up having to take eventually to kind of get there because yeah, you turn pro in your second year. But if you wouldn't have turned pro the second year, would you have been back the next year? Absolutely. You would have been back and, and you would have continued to go. And then I see a lot of these girls and stuff, they're like, they're not getting the gratification right away. They're done. They're done after two years. Right. I mean, I think that shows that you're in it for <sighs> right things. Like, like we've talked about this, Keith, where I see this a lot. Girls get into it they want to move super fast they see either who they look up to or they see these pros that have kind of like fast track you know mm -hmm. career which is rare that's very rare for that to happen so 
I feel like girls see that and they just want, like you said, that instant gratification. And when they don't get it, it is very, it is very difficult to yeah. turn pro. And once you turn pro, it's like a whole different league. It's like, yeah. you're really the best of the best. So once you, you know, get that pro card, you're literally starting at the bottom again. <laughs> you have to like right. work your way up in the pro ranks. And people don't really understand that. So if you're doing it just to get trophies and just to get that validation, like I see that a lot too. People want validation on social media or they want, you know, the acceptance, whatever the case is. And if they don't, they're not getting that, it's kind of like they just give up. They just don't yeah, want to do it. They're doing it for all the wrong reasons at that point. You don't want to do it that fine, but yeah. Yeah. you should want to compete because you enjoy competition and you want to get better that's that's right. the whole purpose for competition you know the validation and stuff of uh, from people on social media that's just insecurities coming to the forefront they need something to feed that insecurity and the problem is that no matter how well they do they'll never feed that insecurity <laughs> that's the biggest right. that's the biggest well, thing you're doing it for all the wrong reasons <laughs> You know, and we had that conversation too, where I was like, in, in the same thing as like, along with just the giving up because they don't do well right off the bat, or the the opposite is they do do really well, but they do like seven shows in two years, you know, and they don't give their body a break, and then they blame the competition as being the devil, you know, yeah. and they have to retire, <laughs> you know, after two years, and it's like, why, why did you like? The stage will always be there. I understand if you want to leave for a couple of years, you don't want to compete for a couple of years, take a break, go do some other things. The stage will always be there if you want to come back. But they just like, they don't do that. They just up and quit. And then they blame it for all their other issues that they have in their life with their body image and everything else. It's no, no, no. You had those problems before that. Right. You know, you had those issues before. Yeah. You, you definitely have to have <laughs> the right mindset coming yeah. and competing. And you can't be doing it to get that validation and to feel better about yourself or to lose weight. Oh, that's, know, yeah. That's, I mean, I, I understand if it started out that way, like, okay, so you wanted to lose some weight, get in better shape. And then you have a sudden you, you realize how much you love going to the gym. Right. You get to that point. You're like, Hey, I, I want to compete. I want to try this. Right. And you try it and you love it, mm -hmm. but it still has, you have the mindset of, okay, this is not, this is not my, my way of staying, staying, body image wise because of the insecurities that I had before this is something now that I'm doing because this is something I want to take it and improve on it and take it as far as I possibly can. It may not be very far, but I want to take it as far as I can. And I want to continue to do it because it's actually fun for me. Right. And it's, it's all about beating your previous self. That's what this sport is honestly yep. all about. So exactly. Have that mindset, you're just constantly be chasing trophies it, like we've talked about, it's like an, mm -hmm. an endless hamster wheel where you're constantly chasing these placings and these trophies and validation where you should be trying to just beat your previous pocket and your previous yeah. and knowing you gave your all. Like So when you do that and get to this, regardless how you place, it doesn't matter because you know that this is your absolute best. and. Yeah. If you don't have that mindset, it's going to be very, you know, self. -love. Yeah, the validation shouldn't be the the placing that you take on stage necessarily at that level. The validation should be how hard you worked, and did you, did you improve upon how you looked the prime before? Because I've seen plenty of people, and Todd, you have too, where they might have they might have taken second or third in their first show, right? And they come back at a harder show a year later. And they place fifth and they're bummed out because they place fifth. And it's like, but you look 10 times better against better competition than right. you did in your previous show where you took third. You were third, but you didn't go against anybody who was in a competition. It was a small show or there were not very many people showed up. And it's all divisions, right? And now you're going against really good stiff competition. And you took fifth, but you look way better than you did the first time. Your, your, your validation should be, I worked my ass off for, for the last... 12, 14, 16, 18, 20 weeks. And this is where I was before. This is where I am now. <laughs> like I look way better now. doesn't matter what the placing is. I unless mean, you're, unless you're like, you know, going, trying to turn pro and that's a pro qualifier. 
You know, you'd be bummed out about that if you're close or if it's a pro show and mm-hmm. you're, you know, there's money at stake and sponsorships. Then I can understand being upset with the placing, you know, especially if you th- felt you did better. But at the NPC level, the local level, it's a fuck. I mean, you need to practice really? to your peak. Yeah. Then, so, I mean, you shouldn't be doing two shows in two years if it's your first two years anyway. Right. You know, that's just assuming that you're perfect and you're ready to turn pro right out the gate. So even if you're perfect, genetics-wise, if your peaking sucks, then what are you going to do when you turn pro? You're just going to show up and you have shitty pro places? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I'm okay with, like, people competing a couple of times right out of, you know, right off the bat, a couple of shows. But right. the problem is that they take it overboard and then they burn out. Well, I find that they could be good, but they 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 go overboard right off the bat, and then they end up being lost forever. And I've seen that a thousand times. I see that with men's physique and bikini a lot, where they're going to be entry level. They'll hit six shows in two years, and they won't turn pro, and they'll quit. Yeah, the fucker, I've been lifting for twenty five (laughs) years. It takes a while to turn pro. What do you mean two years you're not ready to you can go do something else? Like, I'm going to take a backgammon. It's like, what? It's like, well, it's, you, don't, you don't pick up bodybuilding. It's you're a bodybuilder anyway, and you're like, fuck it, I'll compete. Because I've right. been doing this my whole life, and I'm going to keep doing this. Yeah. You don't be like you're not like I want to turn pro. Time to pick up my first dumbbell. You know, and that's not enough of a motivation to get in the gym. You got to well, like. Think a, a lot of it is too is that you know they want to do the competition thing and they want their like you said like Katie like you said this for validation they don't love training to begin with it's just something they have to do they yeah. don't love training and they don't enjoy um, being you know being regimented and staying on a schedule and eating for for health and wellness anyway right because you you can be a bodybuilder you can try, love to train and you can and you can still eat clean for the most part and eat healthy so that you're fueling your body to get, you know, to still be better in the gym and stuff. And to, even if it's just for personal reasons, for cosmetic purposes and how you feel, they don't love doing that shit to begin with. It's, these are the people that are complaining about dieting. Like they're two weeks into a fucking diet and they're asking their coach for a cheat meal and they're posting fucking food porn all over their Instagram. And it's like, just Stop! You haven't even hit the hard part yet. What are you That's doing? Use as a coach. I will yeah. say when a client will ask, "When's my cheat meal?" You know, the yeah. first or second week into that, I'm like, "You're not really." Before they hire you, you're like, "Am I going to get cheat meals?" I'm like, "Oh yeah, cheat meal." How about this? How much? You'll never get for, cheat meals. Three questions. Eat as much as you want, because I don't give a fuck about you if you don't. <laughs> top three. Top three questions. How much cardio am I going to have to do? When, how many cheat meals do I get or do I get them at all? And do I have to follow the plan to a T? <laughs> Top three questions I get right there from, yeah, from, I've never from one. most new competitors. That would annoy me. No, my and, favorite and, is from, and, from you guy, and from guys, it's just how many, how many drugs are you going to no, have? They have a list. Stop. Like, what did you I already bought. <laughs> Tell me how to use it. I'm like, okay, you take that stuff and you put it in the garbage. And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, all this shit you bought is crap. Well, my friend says it's great. I'm like, the friend is giving you all the shit he can't use. Yeah. <laughs> he's emptying out his closet because he needs to pay rent yeah. or child support. <laughs> and he told you all the shit he's not going to use. And now you're trying to build a cycle of a bunch of tub caps and rear view mirrors. Yeah. The drive shafts and the engines and shit. Uh all right, let's get to one of these questions here. I was kind of throw these in. Here, here's a good one, and this would kind of piggybacks what we were just talking about. What three pieces of advice can you give me as I diet for my first contest? And this is this is a female. Okay. Um, one, you can follow everything your coach says to the team. Mm-hmm. Few reasons for that. One, if you hired this coach, hopefully you did your research, so you trust him. Yep. Test them. There's a reason you're getting a coach. Oh, so I would say if you're going to pay somebody higher than why would you not follow what they say? Why would you half follow it, half do your own thing? Follow everything to a T. Um, the other reason for that, when you do get on stage, you can look back at your prep regardless how you place, regardless you you know if you win if you, whatever you you get at the show, you know that you gave your absolute 100 percent. You didn't cheat. Never skipped a party. You, you know, 
did your time that you needed to. And that is a great feeling, like looking back and knowing that you couldn't have done anything else. Um, so follow it to a T. Um, let's see. Don't compare yourself to other girls, other athletes, other pros. Um, I have this conversation all the time with my clients. And girls are probably worse than guys about this. Yeah. Okay. I always say what you see in front of you in the gym or on Instagram on pictures does not translate to the scene. So you see a girl in the gym, they look shredded, they have veins everywhere, they look like, you know, they're super lean. You have no idea what they look like in a bikini. You have no idea what they're going to look like on stage. You have no idea what their posing is like. So you cannot see somebody in the gym or on Instagram and think, oh my gosh, they look so much better than me. What am I doing? Don't compare yourself. It's, mm -hmm. it's useless. It does nothing. It just gets in your own head. Don't do that. Um, so that's my second piece of advice. And let's see. I would say you just try and enjoy the process as much as you can because it is a process. Obviously, it's not always going to be fun. A lot of times it won't be fun. Uh, it's going to suck at points. You're going to be hungry. You're going to be tired. That's part of it. But when I say enjoy the process, enjoy the, you know, you're pushing your limits, you're seeing how much you can achieve, you're really, you have to be disciplined, you have to be very, like, self-aware, um, so try and enjoy the process of just getting better and improving yourself, because it oh. is, like, when you prep, you, your whole entire, it's not just prepping. It's like your whole life changes. Everybody, it improves all aspects of your life. So it does. Enjoy that. Yeah. And know that you're bettering yourself and you're going to be proud of yourself at the end. So even when it sucks, just try and just have fun with it. Enjoy. I know I'm way more productive when I'm dieting for a show. Than I am in the off season. <laughs> like it's right. not even close. The amount of shit that I can get done during a prep. It's a very when like, you're on little to no and, food, you have no energy, but you're just like go 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 all day long. You have to be good at time management. You have to mm -hmm. um, plan plan a lot more. So yeah, it definitely improves other aspects of your life. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, those those are pretty good. Um, the the embracing it and 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 you know all that that's great. I always tell all of them. I said embrace the suck. Learn how to embrace it because it's gonna suck at some point. You're gonna start to suffer, and everybody suffers on different levels because everybody's different, right? Yeah. You know, everybody. Some people suffer. You know, they're gonna suffer a lot more than others because they just have to. They don't have a choice in order to get into shape. Um, and other people are their their suffering is gonna be magnified because some people like, where somebody else might start suffering at at this point, they're not going to start to suffer till they're over here. Right. Because they just have a higher threshold, but at some point is going to get really fucking difficult. And you're going to start questioning why the fuck am I doing this? Uh, and that's when you just have to start embrace it and say, okay, this sucks, but I'm not going to let it beat me. And I'm just going to keep going. And you're going to learn that every time you can handle just a little bit more. So as you energy levels start to do this, you know, your mind needs to do this. Right. And, you know, and if and you just say it's part of it, that's, that's it. That's when a lot of people quit, unfortunately, mm -hmm. when they feel a little discomfort, they feel a little, like, hunger, and yeah. that's when you, oh, that's the point where you're, you're changing. So that's, mm -hmm. like, the magic happens. So just, if I was, if you can get past that point, then you're But a lot of people quit. You know, it's like anything else. You get used to it. Once you once you get there, you get used to it. And you and then the second one becomes more becomes uh, I think a little bit easier. And the one every one after that becomes easier because you already know what to expect. Right. You know, you know what to expect and you become better at at managing it and and fighting through it. Although I now, will say some people are just better at it than others. Yes. Oh like, yeah, absolutely. Some people are just better at embracing the suck. 
than other people. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, they just have like some people's mindset is some people are just weak minded, right? They're just weak minded mm-hmm. and everything that happens to them in their life bothers them. And when you start to give them things that are adverse, those are usually the ones that start to crack first, right? And they don't want to, they don't, either don't want to go through with it or they cheat on their diet or they go half-assed, they start missing cardio because they're tired, you know? And it's like, and then you get other people that are just, they don't, you know, they don't care. They're just like, boom, I'm, I'm doing it. I'm following the steps. This is part of it. They, they're able to tune out and block all of the noise in their head that says this hurts, this, I'm tired, this sucks, a lot of times too, that's the people that train the hardest as well, right? Because the people that train the hardest are the ones that can embrace the pain of training. Right. It doesn't bother them. It's right? also a double-edged sword because if you're trying to grow, you can't be overtraining. And if you've got inflammation starting up, you can't just be a man and tough it out because then you end up getting tendonitis and you have to get worse. So after a certain point, either because you become old or you become a pussy or you become wise, it depends on how you look at it, you're like, <laughs> I'm going to take an extra rest day or I'm going to start icing my knees or I'm going to start increasing my fish oil. And you make what are kind of wise choices rather than just toughing it out, white knuckling it, redlining every single aspect of the sport. Right. Right. And, well, and, and at the same time, though, I, I always tell everybody, I'm like, look, I need to know everything about your training. I need to know everything about your day to day and how you're feeling. When you do your check ins, I need details. I don't want to just know, hey, uh, I'm 113 pounds this week, and here's my check in picks. No. Funny story. How's your, how's your training? How's your digestion? How's your, are you able to get all your food in? How hungry are you an hour after you eat? How's your energy levels throughout the day? When you get an hour before the next meal, are you starting to crash and get angry and 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 just feel lethargic? How's your sleep? So you I know, have- how, all these things because that's that's going to tell me you know where where we're at with things and do I do I need to give you a day off in here? Hey, take I rest day. A good example of this: um, I had a client who was pretty perfect, inhumanly good results, right? Fucking incredible loss in fat for six weeks. I took him off of gear. I took him off of his HRT. I took him off of SARMs. I gave him nothing. That he did, he lost all this fat, didn't lose any muscle. His t- normal test came back as a 53. You know, like That's... everybody else would be panicky, right? <laughs> right. Like, does your dick work? And he's like, yeah. I'm like, does your wife bitch about it? And she's like, no. I'm like, then leave it the fuck alone. Yeah, because you're fine. The results are great. Your wife's not bitching. We don't touch anything. All right, we put testosterone <laughs> in you. We're gonna fuck your dick up for sure. I know it. Mm-hmm. It's like I've yeah. seen this a hundred times. So he's like, he gets back to me like after like ten weeks on the eleventh week or some shit. He's like, I'm sorry that my weight's up this week. I hurt myself deadlifting and I was pl- pissing, shitting, and coming blood. I went to my doctor and he sent me to a GI consult, but I haven't went yet. And he says, also, I felt really guilty about having sour cream on my cheat meal. So I went and had a box of Frosted Flakes with almond milk. And then I felt really guilty about that. So I went and slammed a whole bunch of donuts. Then I felt guilty. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> has been cheating on one tuna roll for like 10 weeks, right? I'm like, first of all, motherfucker, if you can eat like that, you should have been eating like that this entire fucking time on your carb loads. Just not the fat. We've talked about not mixing carbs and fat. You could eat all the carbs in the goddamn grocery store. You could make it look like it's the Czech Republic and it's just in 88. I don't give a fuck. The point is, is also, as far as the, the coming and pissing blood, that'll go away. You don't need to see the GI consult unless it increases. He goes, you're absolutely right. That is going down. I was like, you know, you need to get back to me with this shit. It's con- he goes, I don't want to bug you. I'm like, it's fucking emergency if you're paying for blood. And it's like, <laughs> this is what you're paying me for. Like, specifically, with, I don't want to bug you unless it's emergency. I'm like, if if b- blood is spraying out of all your holes and that's not an emergency, <laughs> it's an emergency. I don't know what that is. It's like that would be my quintessential emergency. Is I'm bleeding out of every hole. You know, that's <laughs> what Doctor Lee gets oh. called. But it's true. A lot of people will, you know, leak blood if they hurt themselves with something mm-hmm. inside. You're, yeah. You either bleed to death that day or you're fine. You know, you're not going to have some massive GI bleed and make it. You're going to have a minor GI bleed that corrects itself. And it's like, 
so in your what you were saying is like the same situation where you're not getting proper feedback in a timely fashion. There's no yeah. judgment. Yeah. Yeah. There's definitely a difference between complaining. And, oh yeah. You know, yeah. like you know the complaint. I I learned by complainers, and then I've learned what's actually good feedback. Yeah. If you're texting me, if I give you your plan, your check-in was like Friday and Saturday you get it, and by Monday you're already complaining. And it's and, and your complaint is, I'm so tired. You took away you took away half my carbs and you and you did this, or this is just a lot of cardio, and it's really I'm really unable. I'm like, and I'm that's just complaining shit, right? That's it's complaining. Not, it's there's no goal. They're not trying to achieve something like may I do 10 minutes less cardio. Yeah. Or, can I do 10 minutes more cardio and have half of my carbs back? They're not negotiating for shit. They're just bitching. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Or, but as opposed to the next Friday, they send me check-ins and say, hey, had some issues this week with, you know, some energy levels that were way, way down. I'm guessing that probably is normal. Uh, my training wasn't the best the last two days, this and that. I, my, my ankles are swollen. My knees are swollen a bit from, from this. These are all, this isn't bitching or complaining. This is just the information you're giving me down the list on a, right. on a Friday on a check-in day. But if you're like bitching at it like early in the week and you're just telling me all this stuff and it's like, what, day one or day two of the changes? No, you're just complaining now. And then I just, that, those are the text messages I just ignore, scroll to the next. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not even going to answer you because it's not that important. No, I, okay, I have a different tactic and mine might not be right. Is that <sighs> if I don't like something, I want to negatively reinforce the behavior, but not ignore it like it's a social relationship. So, like, you know, there's positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, yeah. and no reinforcement. And if someone's acting out for attention, you shouldn't scold them. You should ignore them. Mm -hmm. I feel you can't do that with clients because they're paying you. So you kind of have to take the ignore off the table. So it's like if you're being a bitch, I'm going to lash out and call you a bitch. If you're being – but if you're on point, I'm going to reward you with positive yeah. reinforcement. Mm -hmm. But I don't do the ignoring thing. I might wait till I'm not mad. <laughs> well, I, I will I will not ignore them the first couple of times, but when it becomes a pattern, then I'm just going to ignore you because it doesn't matter what I say. You're just going to complain regardless. These are the people that like – they're when they start once they start dieting and stuff. If their mouth is open, they're probably complaining. Oh, I know those people. <laughs> and it's every day, it's like it's the same thing every day. It's something different, or yeah, it's the same thing. And it's just like, eh, it's just another day. It's Tuesday. <laughs> Tomorrow to be something else. I just, I'm not worried about it. Whatever. <laughs> All right. Uh, next question we have is, and this there's a good one. I, we, I have my my theories on this one, but I'll see. I don't hear what Katie says. Does using the step mill make a large difference over other cardio equipment as far as fat loss? So, <laughs> um, I do like the Stairmaster. I will say, mm -hmm. I always use it for my cardio. That's kind of a tough question. So, I don't think, like, this. people think the Stairmaster is, like, this magic cardio equipment. A lot of girls use it. They're like, oh, it's going to lift my butt. It's going to make, you know, make me look super shot it like it's not a magic thing it's cardio is cardio you're it's mm -hmm. vascular activity you're mm -hmm. getting your heart rate up you're burning calories i feel like the stairmaster is a better um workout calorie burn than say the treadmill but if you really wanted to burn the same amount of calories you could find a way like mm -hmm. you, know, you could do sprints you could you know walk for longer to, to burn. I don't know if you, if they have a heart rate monitor or they have, if they're monitoring. There's ways to get the same calorie burn, but I feel like it's a way to get your heart rate up, get a great sweat going, get a great workout. Yep. I make them get I make them wear all of them wear a heart monitor, whether they have an Apple watch or, you know, Fitbit yeah. or something, some sort of something so they can get a, an accurate read of what, what it's doing that's on them at all times. And I always tell them, 130, get that thing over 130 and maintain that as close to over 130 as you can. Right. Because once your heart rate's at 130, you're in that fat burning zone where you're, 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 you're starting to oxidize fat. We're going to get a little bit lower than that. We're not quite where we want to be. And we don't want to be way up in 150, 160 consistently up there, okay? Because now we're getting into where this is like, you know, 
we're, we're, we're starting to get a little bit different activity and you're just going to have counterproductive results after a while. I don't care if they use the stepper. I don't care if they use the treadmill. I don't care if they use a bike, you know, it's, they're all effective. It just the more is what is, what is a personal choice that you like to do more so that you're going to do it. If you're getting your heart rate up, it doesn't really make a difference as far as I'm concerned. Um, I will say though, that the step mill is probably easier to get your heart rate over 130. There's less, there's less work and effort that has to go into getting it there because it's just harder to do than say walking on a treadmill on flat ground. You get that treadmill all the way up on an incline. It ain't much different. And then you can control the speed and everything else on it. You can get that heart rate up and you can sweat and, and go just as much. The bike has its, has its advantages. The only thing I'll say about the difference of the cardio equipment is, and that is, is it's like, if, if we're trying to, for like, let's say for a bodybuilder, I don't, I really like it when they use the spin bike because I feel like it has a lot of positive effect on the quads and keeping fullness in the quads because of the amount of blood that's going in there on a daily basis, especially when you get down in the, in the nitty of like prep and we're down to low calories and we're getting tons with the edge. You're doing 45 minutes or to an hour on, on of cardio, get on a bike and just go because that, that keeps the quads full of blood and stuff. And it keeps you off your feet, which keeps a lot of the inflammation in the knees and the ankles and stuff, hips, all that kind of away. Cause I've just, I know personally, if I walk a lot for cardio, or do the step mill for cardio, my legs take a beating. They look washed out. They don't look good. It takes a couple of days to get them of off my feet to kind of get them to come back to life. But if I just ride the bike, I'm fine. Yeah. It's totally different. But I mean, it doesn't make it any better. It just makes it for a personal choice of, hey, I like the fact that my quads look better through the prep by riding a bike the majority of the time rather than always being on a stepper or always being on a treadmill. Or I've, in my case, walking outside too. What I found was the um, happy medium, where it's the arc trainer with the high mm-hmm. vertical setting, because I get the benefits of the elliptical and I get the benefits of the stair mill, but I also get the benefits of controlling my own speed. So it's easier to do hit cardio on it. There's no mm-hmm. impact on the ankles that you get from the treadmill. There's no impact on the hips from the stair mill. It's like a bike, but there's no stress on the knees like a bike that the arc trainer mm-hmm. allows. Target my glutes, target my quads. If they're cramping, I can then change the settings and target my hamstrings mm-hmm. or even my calves and then move it back. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think most girls feel like the, the, the got to Got to get my glutes in shape. I got to, they're going to give me, they're going to get my glutes the way they want. And bodybuilders for long, Oh, I get shredded glutes. I got to get on the step mill. No, right. <laughs> it's not, you're not targeting fat. You're targeting the muscle. You might target the muscle and make the muscle fuller looking by, by targeting that mm. over time, but it's not going to, I mean, fat loss is fat loss. It's going to come off your body this, the opposite way it goes on. Right. I think it was um, Shelby Starnes made a, made a post like at some point, probably multiple times about mm. the Stairmaster just saying, you know, he posted this like statements. He said something about the Stairmaster is not a magic piece of party equipment. Yeah. It doesn't magically get your group. Shredded. No, um, nothing, nothing will. I mean, it's just diet. It's not, it's not magic. Yeah, diet, diet does that. It's just a matter of getting lean enough um, mm-hmm. for the stage. However, that is going to happen. So, mm-hmm. I like the stairmaster. Some people like it. Some people don't. But at the end of the day, it is up to your coach. Whatever mm-hmm. you have to, do, to do. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'll use, I'll use all, I use, I'll either walk outside, walk on a treadmill, <laughs> ride a bike, or use the, use the step mill. And I found that if I'm just going to do low intensity cardio, I'd rather do the treadmill or walk outside or use the step mill. And if I'm going to do the hit cardio, or if I want to pick up my cardio pace up, then I'll ride the bike. Yeah, I love doing hit hit cardio on a bike. Do 15 second sprint intervals with 45 seconds going real real slow, and I'll and if I write that in somebody's plan too, I always put hit cardio on either recumbent or spin bike, either one, your choice, whichever one you have or which whatever one's more comfortable for you, and it's 15 45, and I'll do like 20 intervals or 10 intervals or whatever it is, and I found that works. <laughs> it's, it's safer. Like I don't have to worry about somebody trying to do hit cardio on a fucking step mill and, and ended up on ended up on their face. <laughs> 
see that sometimes in the gym, and I'm like, I know. I don't what know. are you doing? <laughs> or somebody doing sprint intervals on the on the um on the treadmill, and you watch them sprint real fast, and they, they jump off the sides, and they just stand there. And then you got a kid to get that speed back up again. It's like you're gonna fall. I'm just like just every time I'm waiting for him to end up out, off the backside of that thing. Yeah. I usually tell them the bike is your best bet and your second go to if you don't have a bike or if in the gym or if you just have a problem with the bike in general. The elliptical is okay to do, uh, to do hit cardio on. Right. But it's not but my favorite. So as far as like and steady state of your coach, but at least for my kind, I don't like to hit. As you get closer to a show, because I feel like your your energy is lower, you're more tired, you're not gonna be able to give that full out effort on your sprint mm-hmm. hit is truly effective. So mm-hmm. I don't even like to give it, you know, if you're anywhere close to a show. I uh I usually don't do it with like bikini or or even I want to be wellness now too. I right. won't do I probably won't do the hit cardio with that. I just feel like the low the low intensity steady state cardio is better. Okay. We don't need to get you down to 6% body fat, right? So what's the point of the we're, we're, the hit doesn't come in unless we're going to do like a 6 week prep. <laughs> you know. Somebody, <laughs> the, or you're way like, way behind. Right. And they've got like legs they need to really get down. Yep. Um, yep. But, but again, I don't like to do it close to a show because i don't want i don't want girls you know i'll save Uh i'll save hit cardio for figure uh women's physique bodybuilding i'll say i'll save that for them you know that's the ones we need to get you down into the low single digits and stuff you know that's where that comes in and a lot of times we just do a post-workout because you're already warmed up and ready you know, your body's already warmed up to go do 10 sprint intervals at that point. I w- will be effective and it'll keep that epoch going after for hours and hours and hours. Your body's just burning extra calories for the rest of the night. But if you to get somebody who's like dead tired, very few carbs, get mm-hmm. them up early in the morning and have them do fasting cardio and do hit. Yeah. I, yeah, you're right. It's not going to be very effective because like, it, it's going to take them 10 minutes to wake up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I have some clients that will ask me to add and hit to their plans. And that's how I know they're not really, I'm like, okay, I can push you harder. Like if you yeah. want to add and hit, that means we're not pushing hard enough. Right. You're not they, should, they should see hit cardio and go, fuck. Right. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Or they don't know what it is. Or they yeah. Don't, they intend to be yeah. with my medium intensity at best. Right. Hit cardio is just an extension of training. Really, it's, it's really the same thing. You're going really, really hard for a short interval and then you're resting to get the heart rate back down towards you know resting rate and then you're blowing it real high again and you're just you're just doing this over and over again yeah. it's really the same same concept right so you're just an extension of training whereas with the steady state you know you get it up to 130 or so 140 and you just kind of keep it there to burn burn calories I, if they're not training hard they're probably not going to do the hit hard either. <laughs> so there's really no sense in giving somebody who's going to get on a bike and they're going to get like 80 RPMs. And it's going to be, you know, it's like, it just can give you 45 minutes of, of, you know, steady state. Here you go. That's, that's the trick. Cause you're just not going to do it hard anyway. If we do it long enough, we might get something going here. Right. Right. All right. All right. Here's a good one. How much time and how often do you spend time practicing your posing so i recommend obviously as you start prepping you want to do it as much as you can Mm -hmm. um when you watch the pros even we're practicing pretty much all the time year round Mm -hmm. and it's not so much because we don't know our routine or we're afraid we're going to forget or whatever it's more so like a subconscious thing. You're not necessarily getting better every single time that you practice, but you're just, it's like anything that you do over and over, you're not having to think about it. So when you get on stage, you don't want to have to think about it. All you want to do is walk out there, do what you practice a million times. So that's why we practice so much. Um, For me, I practice a a few times a week um, right now. When I get close to your show, I try and do it every day after my training, at least mm-hmm. five, 10 minutes, run through routine, run through poses. Um, so it depends, you know, how close you are to the show. But 
you can never start too early. Like it's right. never, it's never. Start. Well, I, for me, it's like, I don't think people understand who have never done it, how hard it is to pose on stage. Oh, yeah. But you're cramping, you know, you're in uncomfortable positions that are unnatural. I know a lot of bikini girls that complain about their lower backs being tight during because they've got to keep their back arched the whole time and their back is like inflamed and they're like, they're cramping and it's hard to hold this position. It's like, well, yeah, you didn't practice enough. Right. Right. <laughs> if you practice more, that wouldn't be a problem because it's literally like second nature at that point. Yeah. Definitely. And your body's conditioned to doing it. You can always tell the people that have practiced a lot of posing because they're really, really well to get in and out of their poses quickly and effortlessly and they can hold them forever. Right. They just can. And they don't have to think about it on stage. Exactly. Especially your first show. Like I have girls come to me that have never posed before, never done a show. And, and they're three weeks out. Three weeks out. Yeah. And like people underestimate how difficult it is, how long it takes to actually yeah. look natural up there. Um, well, it's they look at it and they go, well, there's only two poses. How hard can it be? Right. Well, there is only two poses, but it's the two poses and mastering the poses. So it constantly looks like a screenshot, right? Yeah. You just get into it and you're able to hit it and you just hold it. And then it's being able to transition from one to the next with fluidity and still have good stage presence and be able to do it where, you know, you're smiling, you're able to get in and out of it. And what they don't understand, uh, this, this, this is what bothers me, is, and Todd, we've talked about this, is bikini is not just how you look. It's how you present yourself. Your stage presence and up there and the way you present yourself is, you know, at least a third of the judge's mind of their score that they're giving you. You know, yeah, obviously you have to look good. You have to be put together. You're not going to go out there with a ponytail and no makeup on, right? But the posing and stuff and the stage presence and how you interact with the judges and with the, with the crowd and, and how you, you know, how confident you are up there is a big part of how you do. Because I've seen plenty of girls that don't look very good that pass girls up that look really good because a girl can't pose and she has yeah. no stage presence and they just right. pass them up because it's like, hey, well, yeah. you didn't do your homework. You look great, but you didn't do the rest of it. Right. Stage presence is huge. Just confidence. Um, I see, like, yeah, I see a lot of girls that you know from the second they walk out that they're going to do well just because of how they carry themselves. Um, they're confident. That's a big thing they look for. Yeah. So you want to practice enough where when you're on stage, you're not having to think about every move. Like, people don't think about the nerves. They don't factor in the nerves. You're going to be yep. nervous on stage. So even if you have your pose down, nervous, it's like that can go out the window and it just makes yeah. it harder. So you want to be so comfortable where when you get up there and the judges are calling out the poses, you know, that you, you don't have to think about it and you're just smiling. So yeah. that's a lot. Okay. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's, I think, I think they, like you said, they're underestimated stuff and they, they think they know how to pose and they try to do their posing. Um, but I think that getting a posing coach, number one, is probably your best bet, right? Yeah. Especially if it's your first show. Just get somebody to show you the basics. You don't have to use a posing coach every single time, but getting somebody to show you how to pose for your first show right. is probably a really good idea. Who knows what they're talking about. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Get somebody that knows what they're talking about. Get the wrong, you know, posing yeah. that doesn't necessarily know. And bikini also. Don't go get a bodybuilder, a guy coach. Not that they don't know bikini, but they don't always know. So make sure that they know bikini. They have clients who have posed before, been successful. That's that's a big thing. Don't oh, I, I, body off the street. I mean, I can put you in the pose and tell you how the pose looks best on you to stand there to get into it. But when it comes to like getting you into the pose and everything else, I will always defer to somebody else. Yeah. Like I'll be like, hey, here's one you call and here's another person to call that I usually I always recommend them. Go give them a call and have them work on your your transitions and everything. This is how I think those standing there, just standing there to take a picture of it is how you need to end the pose because this is your best. And I can tell them, you know, like head up, chest up, waist in tight, stand up straight, don't lean forward too far. 
nope, you need to lean, lean forward a little bit more. Your body says this looks better here. Get that foot back. I can tell them all that stuff, right? Yeah. But to get them in and out of it, I, it's, not, it's not the same thing coming from me. I'm not going to be able to tell them how to do it, you know, and with a smile on their face. Right. You know, I'll defer to a couple other girls and I'll be like, hey, give her or give her a call and see what they can work out a schedule. They can just kind of go over the rest of your posing with you and stuff and kind of check a few things. Right. I can tell you what looks good. I can't tell you how to do it necessarily all the, you know, all the way through. Right. So I won't, you know. And if you think about it, posing is the one have 100% control over. Yep. Like, you can't control who shows up, who you're up against. That is, you have 100% control. Yep. So if you don't have your posing down, that is, really dumb on your part because yeah. you put like you have every resource you have like I said 100% control over that so if you get to your show and you can't pose that is one thing that should never happen mm-hmm. very true all right let's see you kind of answered it already, but let's get into this. So this is kind of the thing on the posing. What's the best advice you have for the girls who have trouble with their stage, stage presence, especially if they have trouble with the sassy and flirtatious aspects? Just practice early. Start early. Don't feel like you have to put on this, this facade of the girls that you see, you know. I'm not that way in real life. I'm not like a super bubbly person. They don't want you to, to fake like a personality on stage. What they want to see is just confidence. So if that means yeah. for you, that's more, um, what's the word? Don't feel like you have to be overly bubbly and, you know, all excited on stage. Your own personality will work. You yeah. just want to be confident with it. Yeah, confident in who you are and how you look. Yep. Right. So you can be unique. You don't have to copy other people's posing or what they look like on stage, but you want to be confident and just know that you're rocking it. Yeah. Right. No, that's good advice. Uh, let's see. All right. What is something that you learned about the industry along the way that you wish you knew when you started? Oh, gosh. <laughs> you can give me more than one, but yeah. <laughs> let's see. Um, I would say a big one, again, comparing other people, and I've, I've always been pretty good about this, not comparing myself to other people, uh-huh. but you just have to know what you bring to the table, bring to the sport, and know why you're doing it, and uh-huh. just be confident in that. So, like, like we already talked about, doing this for the right reasons, don't do it. So that you can look like somebody else. Don't do it to that. Oh, I love this person. I want to be exactly like them. I want to do everything they did. I want to turn pro like they did. No. Do it because for your own reasons. Because you want to. Don't compare yourself to how this person did or their journey or their timeline. Because everybody's timeline is so different. You know? Uh My girls even will see like me and they'll say, well, I want to turn pro in a year like you did. I'm like, well, that is very rare. Like that just happens a lot. Um, yeah. So it's all about your own journey. And that just, it's like you talked about enjoying it. Yeah. Else. yeah. I mean, there's, there's, there's so many things that I, that I wish I would have known. But then again, it's also changed a lot since I started competing because I'm a dinosaur and I was competing a long time ago. And like, there was no social media when I started yeah. like face, Facebook was pretty new. It only been around for a couple of years. Nobody was posting anything on there yet. There was no Instagram, you know, Which I is, think uh, no, because, because I don't know. It's like you, you did it because you really wanted to. Yeah. I really wanted to do it. I just loved it. And, but I think, I think that some of that stuff too, that's, that's the stuff that a lot of these competitors, these new competitors don't realize. Right some of that stuff where they're like they're yeah you're utilizing this as a tool but how are you coming across also like i think they and i know i have too where i've looked back at something that i posted like five years ago and it eh, shows by my memories and i'm, eh, I'm glad i 
that's like a distant memory because <laughs> like that, I probably shouldn't have said that, or I probably shouldn't, have, you yeah. know, people can really, really, really dig themselves holes right. early on by doing some of the things and saying some of the things that they, you know, that they probably should keep to themselves. Right. But then again, sometimes, you know, that's just, if that's just who you are, that's who you are. And you just live with no regret. It doesn't make a difference more. So what you post of how you portray yourself um, physically. I know, you know, you see it all the time. Some of these girls, man, they just are fucking shameless with what they post, mm-hmm. especially on Instagram. And it's all about the likes. And it's like, you know, in five years, is it really going to matter? You know, all those likes, are they going to matter? Because they don't make a difference on your, you know, if you're on stage. Nobody right. knows how many fucking likes you get when you're on stage. They just know how you look and how you present yourself there. You know, you just got to be careful about some of the stuff. I think for myself, I probably would, if I had to tell myself all over again, I'd be like, stay the fuck off social media altogether. This devil called social media that's about to start, just ignore that and just be a bodybuilder, <laughs> you know, because it probably would have helped me a lot, uh, you know, get where I wanted to go a lot quicker. Right. Ignoring certain things. Even when I started, Instagram wasn't, it really wasn't. Yeah. At least for me, it wasn't. Yeah. Um, and I've even told myself now, like, think back, getting back to that mindset of like when I, my first show, I literally was doing it because I wanted to. I sure. wasn't doing it for anything else. Instagram wasn't even, you know, that wasn't my business, wasn't on there. Like, it was because I was just pushing myself every day. Nobody saw. Mm-hmm. They tell anybody, you know, nobody knew what I was doing. I just, I just freaking did the work. So I, I almost have to like go back to that mindset. Um, and just, yeah, remember why, why I'm doing this in the first place. Um, yeah. Take out, take out that from the equation because it is, it's such a big part of fitness now, which is great. It's like a great tool. I wouldn't have a business without it. Right. And it, you know, like, it's a great tool, but it makes things a lot more. Things are not as they seem. Mm-hmm. And I try and tell you know my clients and just younger girls that a lot. The further up I get in this industry and I meet more people and like you know well known people, nothing is as it seems. I mean, um, it's all very like for show. Which I get. It's all about that's that's what people want to see nowadays. But you can't you can't go off what you see on Instagram or what you see in social media or even what you see in real life from people. A lot of it is just for a show. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's, that's not. A <clears throat> well, I it's I think it's ruined. Uh it's ruined the ability to improve as a competitor, unless you already have the mindset that you just know that, Hey, look, I got to get fat in the off season or I got to, I got to put some weight on, you know, in order to, to get bigger and get better or whatever, you know, because everybody now just wants to look around, wants to walk around like they're stage ready yeah. because they see Joe blow or Jane Doe on Instagram, right? Shredded year round, but mm-hmm. they're not. See, that's what they, the people miss is that they're not. They're only showing you what they want you to see. It's not, like you said, it's not what it seems because they take a thousand pictures in a two week span and post those all year. They were getting ready for a show, right? They took as many pictures as they could, selfies, whatever. They changed lighting. They did this. They took, they t- took 10 pictures in a 15 minute span with five different outfits on, right? And they'll just use those all year and post them. And the rest of the year, they've put on the necessary weight that needs to be, you know, to to put on the muscle. And they're not afraid to walk around, you know, 10, 15 pounds, 20 pounds for some females over their stage weight or guys 40, 50 pounds over our stage weight, you know, because we know what we need to do. And now you've got a whole generation of kids coming up that think they need to be shredded all year round and they don't ever improve. Right, just stay the same all the way through, and it's like it's very frustrating to me. Oh, I don't want to get. I I put in a plan. No, we lost her. Come back. We're still recording. All right, hold on. I'll call her back. Come back. What's the next question? Uh, the next one is the very last one I have, and it's about uh, breast implants and if they're um. 
if they're actually make or break. I wanted to get that one in too because that was a specific one that somebody like, like two people actually asked a similar question. I mean. <sighs> Wonder if her internet went out on her. Yes, me. Come on. What do you think about that, Todd? Are are they are they make or break for females in bikini? You mean when it comes to winning a bikini competition? Yeah, at the, let's talk about the pro level. I think that boobs are an important part of femininity. In so far as just you know, it's a feminine attribute. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. My computer just died. I knew that was gonna happen. <laughs> I can hear you. I can't see you. Though. That's fine though. <laughs> I was getting more encouraged. I knew that was gonna happen. That's fine. So the uh, the last question that I actually have, this is I want. I got I got this from two different girls. Was what is your take on breast implants for female competitors? Is it make or break? I got into this argument the other day, and I want your opinion. Okay, that I was just talking about this. So perfect. I actually my at, at the national show before I turned pro, mm -hmm. my feedback from Sandy, the head judge, she came up to my coach and she said, Has she ever thought about getting enhancements? That's what my feedback was. So then I I did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I turned pro after that. It it matters. Um to the point where if you have a good amount of muscle, which I did, but you're small up top, it can definitely throw off your physique. So it balances everything. It almost makes your upper body look bigger too. Yep. Um, like I said, especially if you have more muscle and lower body, it can really balance things out. Like you'd be surprised how much more symmetry it can give and just a more aesthetic look. But that being said, it's not necessary. So I don't want girls to feel like they need implants to succeed in the sport or turn pro because I know plenty of pros who don't have implants. Right. Um, Jennifer Dory, who's second in the world now, she, I think up until this year, she did not have implants. Mm -hmm. um, so they're not necessary, but it probably just depends on your physique. Yeah. You know? By your, just your structure too. I mean, like you said, if you got a girl that's got, a little bit bigger legs, uh, bigger, bigger lower body altogether. And they're a little smaller up top, but they're not quite like wellness size lower body. Mm -hmm. It will balance you out up top because it, yeah. gives you, it gives you curves the other direct, the opposite direction to kind of put you back in balance. Right. Um, I, tell, I, I tell girls this, I'm like, look, it's not necessary at the NPC level. It's probably not even necessary for everyone to get to the high national level. Some may need it to turn pro. Most won't. But when you get to be a pro, they pretty much all got them. Mm -hmm. And if you want to be competitive, that's probably a good idea. And that's usually what I what I tell people. But until you're to that level, you it's not a necessary thing. Right. And don't get them. Like, say you do want to balance your physique. Don't get yep. them solely for the fact of that. Yeah, get them because you want them. Because you want them. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, it's nope. not shallow. It's not, there's nothing wrong with it. But don't get it just because you're like, oh, I want to do better in competing. Let me get breast implants. Do it because you right. want them. Yeah, because when you're done competing, you might hate it. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. And who knows? You might only do a few shows. So get right. it because you want them. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good answer. But yeah, that was my, that was my feedback um, right before I turned pro. So it, they do see that. Yeah. They, oh, yeah. I know. They know this. They, they do, and obviously, I mean, it, it helped you. Probably helped get you over the hump a little bit. As far yeah. As, you know, to, yeah. to that up to that level, but yeah. doesn't mean that you couldn't have, you know, gone a couple more years and gotten to the point where you were just lights out and turned pro anyway, right? Right. Right. That's that's kind of like what I, I've had that conversation too. It's like you probably don't need them if you're just lights out to begin with. But then most of these girls aren't to that freak level lights out and don't get there anyway. So you might need it to, like you said, to balance, just to balance you out. Yeah. Complete, complete the look. Dependent on your, on your physique and your frame yeah. and your yep. muscle. Yep. Yeah. If you're small all over anyway, and you're still symmetrical, it's not, it's not going to be, it's not yeah. going to make or break. Definitely. All right. Todd, you got any questions? 
What's your training like? What is what? I'm sorry. What's your training like? So I've always done my own training, actually. Even, like, now I'm coaching myself, but even when I had coaches, I did my own just because I know myself and I know I've been training for a while. Um, I know what muscle groups I need to work, how many times, you know. But for that, for most people, I would definitely recommend having your training program by somebody else, by your coach. Um, but right now I'm doing pretty much even upper body and lower body. I used to do glutes three times a week. And mm-hmm. a lot of bikini girls will do, will do mm-hmm. that, like legs and glutes, two or three times, which is, it's okay, but you don't want to overtrain them for one because you're actually going to stunt your growth if you do them too much. Um, and then I've been trying to balance my upper and lower body. So I've been adding more upper body days. So that's really helped a lot. So it's kind of up to the individual. Um, I'm definitely all about heavy training, but I'm also about intentional training for bikini. Yeah. So it's definitely a different style of training than um other divisions and people kind of like laugh about it they're like oh bikini you know bikini that's not a certain training style i mean it is you know you have to you can't train like a bodybuilder like i've had i've had male coaches give me plans that i've been three to four heavy compound exercises leg press squat you know that's not the goal that i'm working towards mm-hmm. so there's definitely a style to train for bikini. So, um, you know, make sure your coach is familiar with that. And it, it does help. Even if you know what you're doing in the gym, it does help just to have that training plan. You go and you don't have to think about it. You kind of just execute the plan. So yeah, that is nice. Yeah, I, I always I, I tell I tell the girls as far as an intensity standpoint, you're going to train just as intense as I do. We're just not going to train certain things because there's no right. really no, there's no tra- there's no point in, in us doing chest training for a bikini girl. Right. You're not you're not being scored on it. Right. You need enough delt training to have a little roundness to your shoulders. Your back training needs to be more more focused towards width than anything else for mm-hmm. taper, and the majority of your work is going and you don't really need arms right we can put throw an arm yeah. exercise in there it's not something that we need to do i hate when i see bikini girls and it's like arm day and i'm like why i know what is the point well, what is the point doesn't know yeah their coach probably doesn't really know <laughs> it's like the majority of your training needs to be lower body and delts because that's what you're getting scored on the most besides your stage presence right we right. need some core work in there. We can do core work and stuff, but we don't even need to do like, you know, you don't need to be doing crunches and stuff to, to your blue in the face. We need to do more, um, you know, like planks, vacuums, because you're working from the insulin, mm-hmm. it will keep your stomach flat. You know, we can do some hanging leg, right? You can do some of that kind of stuff, but the majority of your training needs to be around that lower half because that is going to, that's going to be what, you know, wins, wins shows for you from a physique standpoint. Right. And you still want, like you mentioned, intensity. Yes. You still want to train with intensity for for yourself. Like, yeah. girls will ask me, you know, what if I can't lift as heavy as somebody else? You want to doesn't lift matter. the heaviest that you can. It doesn't matter. Right. Like, you know, we all have different strengths. Like, I'm not super strong. But right. I lift as intense and, and heavy as I can. And that's right. what's going to help me grow. You know, like. So you still want to lift with, with the intensity that you're able to. It doesn't matter the weight that you're yeah. able to lift. The weight is relative to the person. The intensity is not. The intensity right. is, is, exactly. is, ever, is, is basically just across the board. You need to be lifting as intensely as you possibly can and, you know, going to failure and, and pushing yourself, you know, as, as much as you can. The volume and all that kind of stuff is going to be more dependent on the person and the recovery. 
Uh, but the weight is just going to be dependent upon how strong are you. And you should be trying to get stronger, obviously. You know, you're yeah. trying to overload the muscle to get stronger, to make it grow bigger, to make it look better. Because a, a stronger muscle that you can, you can lift heavier with is going to end up looking better anyway. It's just going to be bigger. It's going to be rounder. It's going to be fuller looking, especially when you diet. It's not going to wither away and be flat, you know. Right. And I'm sure, like, Keith, you can probably tell this, too. I can see girls, and I know right away that they don't train heavy enough. Yep. Especially when they get in their back pose. Mm-hmm. And it's always, like, a shame when they have a good shape and they have a good, you know, front front pose physique. And then they get into their back pose, and they just don't have glutes. And it's you can just tell that it's from not training heavy enough. Well, they're too busy and, doing the, the Instagram movements yeah they're doing they're doing yeah. they're doing cable kickbacks till they're blue in the face right and they're not doing heavy heavy hip thrusts and squatting yeah. squat variations because that's i'll still say there's really that's all you need to build glutes is you need to do hip thrusts very heavy and intensely mm-hmm. and you need to find one or two squat variations that target mm-hmm. your glutes and yeah not your quads and that's how they'll grow right also right. Like the abduction machine yeah, because then you're you're working the glute minius and medius, but that's mm-hmm. like you want to work the maximus the most because that's going to be the money maker. That's the one that's going to grow the biggest. You're going right. to work the the median the and the min anyway when you're doing hip thrusts and when you're doing squats. If you're if you're targeting your glutes, you're going to work it you know indirectly. But yeah, if you want to work those muscles directly at the end, then yeah, do do the abduction machine because that's going to be that's going to work those. But I mean, you, you pick those three, you do three movements like that. It can be your entire glute workout. And I, you have better glutes than these girls that are doing 50 different moves with 40 sets right. and no weight. And you weight. stick to the same. You don't ever have to change it. I have, right. I have tons of clients who will ask me, like, when are you changing my training plan after two weeks? And I'm like, never. I mean, I'll change it, but I do the same. I do the same exercises. You know, I switch them up some. But somewhat, but for the most part, I do the same exercises because I know that they work. Um, You just progress on them. And yeah, you don't need 50 different movements every workout. You just stick to what works and you don't have to get fancy with it. Girls always want to get super fancy. Um, Just do what's, what's going to work and what's going to bring your best physique to the stage. And you can just tell when girls aren't doing that and it's just like a shame because i'm like if you would have just trained harder <laughs> you would have a great physique right yeah i i've been doing you know there's you don't really need to maneuver your exercises all over i've been doing the same four basic moves for pretty much every muscle group mm-hmm. for the last what about 15 years yeah yeah <laughs> especially for quad i have really not changed my quad training at all it's leg extensions, hack squats, squats, leg press. Those are the four right there. Yeah. And that's it. And I'll throw in like walking lunges when, when, when contest prep starts. And that's, that's literally it. You know, chest, I've been doing the same basic three moves for, for the entire time. I haven't changed that at all. You don't need to change stuff up. You may want to pull one out for a little bit, put something mm-hmm. else in there just for, for yeah. a few weeks, just, just for variety. But once you find the basics and you find the basics at work, you just stick with them and you just get better at them. Right. Exactly. I mean, Todd's been, you've been training, training back and, you know, the same way for probably your entire career for the most part. At least and your, your back, your back is fantastic. There's no reason to change it. Right. Yeah, it's pretty simple. You just watch blood and guts and then do it. <laughs> just, just do what Dorian did. Just do, exactly do what Dorian did. And if you want to do it, like, I don't use the Nautilus pullover. I do ropes. Mm-hmm. And I use two handles from the wrist. And I don't do um, pull downs. I do pull ups. Yeah. And I Same don't thing. do bent rows. I do Smith bent rows. And right now I'm not doing dumbbell rows. I'm doing Meadows rows instead of dumbbell right. rows. And instead of doing from the floor conventional deadlift in Romanians, I'm using a hammer strength shrug machine for my Romanian. Yeah. But that same be, thing. But they're the same basic movements. I've changed mm-hmm. the variations. Yeah. And in four months, two or three of them might be swapped out for a different variation. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, it's like chest. I'm like I'm doing a I'm doing doing some sort of a fly movement to start. I do an incline press. 
and I do a flat press. And sometimes I do the incline press, the flat press before the incline press. And then sometimes it's a barbell and sometimes it's, it's like a hammer strength machine. And that's the, that's, that's it. There's no variation from it. It's like the same thing methodically over and over and over again. I'll go eight weeks and then I'll switch a couple of them out and then I'll go another eight weeks and I'll switch. There's no reason to change. If it works, why? Like I got that question too. It's like, you haven't changed my training in like four weeks and I'm probably not going to for at least another four. Yeah. Are you, are you making improvements? Well, yeah. Then why would I change it? Right. Oh, <laughs> well, I mean, even on that same note, like, so the, I have the same basic four movements for chest that Dorian does, which is mm-hmm. he does incline barbell, mach- in, uh, machine press, mm-hmm. dumbbell flies, cable crossover, stretch, and then cable crossovers for contraction. So what I do is I do a pre-exhaust with one pack deck for stretch and contraction, mm-hmm. and I do the incline Smith, then I do um, cable crossovers, and then I do machine press. And that's because I've maxed out the machine and I was getting right. So I had to move the machine later in the workout so that I So you're fatigued. Like right. Yeah. <laughs> I just uh I just I don't max out machines, I just make pins and shit to to, to tie to them so that we can add more. <laughs> <laughs> I made one. I made one at work. I made one of those gym pins. Yeah. But instead of mine having an Olympic Olympic collar on it, it's got mm-hmm. a standard a standard pin on there, so I can put whatever plate you need on there. And it's about eight inches long, and then it's got a a, a three ace dowel that's another eight inches. It'll get into any machine. It fits every single machine at Maximus. I don't have to worry about it. I use I use it on the uh, on the adductor machine because I maxed the adductor machine out years ago. Mm-hmm. And it's hard pinning plates on there with stealing pins out of other machines. So now I got this thing. I can load like a few 45s on this thing if I if need be. <laughs> so we don't have to worry about maxing out the adductor machine anytime soon. <laughs> I <need laughs> if I max that extender. out, we got problems. Yeah. Huh? I need a pin extender like <laughs> Jordan Peters has for this. Well, this, that's what this is. This is this is this is about eight inches long and it's just a pin that it goes in, but then it's got a bigger pin that that mounts to it right. I get that. Just, yeah it's just like the his, gym pin but it's not his, his are different though they slide over the actual end of the bar oh i got you i got you yeah. they're different than the pin loaded plate machines yeah they're, he he, he slides loaded. another it's like an yeah. extra sleeve that goes over yeah. i can make it's one the, of those too yeah i need i get bored at work i'll just make one make <laughs> one for me because i'm maxing <laughs> up the machine on squats and i uh, okay. keep moving other things in front of it <laughs> <laughs> Smith machines, they only give you this much, this much. It's not, it's not a lot. It's yeah. Not a lot. Yeah. No, they didn't, they didn't have you in mind, apparently, when they made that one. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you got any other questions, Todd? No, I'm, I'm set. Okay, cool. Well, um, you want to plug anything, Katie, while, while we got you on here still? I know you got a website. I, I, um, I do. I have a website. It's all pretty much on my Instagram. Um, mm-hmm. Everything's just my name so first and last name katie Kopfel. Mm-hmm. um but yeah i mean so i'm a coach i coach bikini prep i coach regular lifestyle clients i i teach posing um any of the above so yeah if anybody needs any help i'd be more than happy to help them or answer any questions awesome yeah i'll, I'll put it i'll put it the uh in the uh, the show notes and stuff, I'll put okay. your website and all that yeah. on there and stuff. If anyone gets a hold of you for for coaching or for 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 posing and stuff, which I might have a couple of girls to send your way, actually. So okay, that. cool. So, all right. Well, I appreciate you coming on. Yeah. Well, thank you. Sorry, my video cut out. Ah, you're good. You're good. We got we got it all recorded. So, all right. That's all well, that I appreciate matters. it. Yeah, it's fine. Nice so, meeting you. So for Katie Kopfel and for Dr. Todd Lee, I am Keith Aubrey. This is Weekly Grind Podcast, episode number 86, sponsored by Valhalla Labs at valhalla-labs.com and by Kodiak Bodybuilding Apparel, kodiakbodybuilding.com. And I'm wearing one of their uh, Make America Huge Again t-shirts right now, and shipping is always free. Uh, next week, coming back, I don't know the exact guest if it, we're going to have. I do know that I've got Ivani Vucic on, on board to come on. We do have Roman Fritz in a couple of weeks. Uh, So look for episode 87 next week with the unnamed guest. And if anybody has a guest that they want out there when they see this,
shoot me a message. I'll get them on. Until uh, next time, guys, thanks for coming on again. It's been good.